Welcome to the stage, founder and executive director of Summit Impact, Shira Abramowitz. Ah. Hello. Welcome to one of the very first sessions at Summit at Sea. Have you ever tried to build something that you believed could really change the world for the better? You know, jumped out of bed in the morning, committed to a brighter future, put in the long hours, really given everything you have to a vision or a dream that you believed in? Go ahead and raise your hand. Yeah, I hear some yeses. Raise your hand if that's been you. Right. Thought there'd be a lot of you in this room. <laughs> now raise your hand again if while building that vision and that dream, you've ever felt a bit lonely or isolated. One of our favorite summit speakers, psychotherapist Esther Perel, often says that the quality of our relationships determine the quality of our lives. And Summit, at its core, is really about fostering meaningful relationships, about building community. Because for leaders and change makers, strong relationships not only help us feel less alone, they can really radically expand our capacity for impact. They propel us forward, they help us face the most difficult challenges, they convert our solo work into a collective, creative effort for a better future for all. We aren't meant to do this work alone. And we started Summit Impact, the social good arm of Summit, three and a half years ago, to activate this network for social good, to specifically try to foster relationships within the field of social impact. And today you get to hear from five of our outstanding Summit Fellows, these remarkable climate leaders. These are people who are dedicating their lives to brilliant solutions like coral reef restoration and sustainable mineral extraction and building the next Silicon Valley, but a blue one in Barbados. So after they present, we'll actually have breakouts with each of the fellows. You'll have a chance to discuss their work, ask questions, share ideas. So as you listen to their presentations, consider what you might have to offer. Maybe an introduction, an idea, a word of encouragement, and perhaps most importantly, see if you can really see yourself in their story. See if you can also see yourself in this wider fabric and community that we're weaving together that can turn ideas into reality. Really tune in. Yeah, see if you can envision this beautiful world that they are all building and that we are all building together. So with that in mind, please join me in giving a really big welcome and round of applause for our first Summit Fellow to take the stage, John Hutzchalek. Welcome to the stage, founder and CEO of BioTerra and Summit Impact Climate Fellow, John Hutzchalek. Hi, good morning, everybody. Wow, what a turnout. Seriously, after last night, I figured maybe two or three people would make it here, crawling out of their beds. But so many people, thank you so much for being here. And also a big thank you to the Summit Impact team for making me a fellow and for giving me the opportunity to be here and chat with all of you today. So, my name is John Chutzhalek, and I am a proud citizen and resident of Suriname, the greenest, most forested country on Earth. We have 93% forest cover, and we are one of only three carbon negative countries in the world. And it's my mission to keep it that way. So today I stand in front of you as CEO and co-founder of Biotara. Biotara is a company that's going to revolutionize the cosmetics industries and their supply chain, specifically as how they interact with forests and how they gather wild oils. But before we get to that, I do wanna take a second and just share a little bit with you about how I got on this journey to begin with. So, in 2011, my life changed forever, I want to say, because I was, I was working on this assignment for government where they asked me, hey, John, what has conservation actually meant to Suriname? What kind of jobs has it created? What kind of income has it generated? So to answer that question, I had to do a lot of studying. And during that process, I discovered that the city that I grew up in, Paramaribo, will be unlivable by the end of this century. The city I grew up in, unlivable. 
So, so I remember exactly when it happened. I was sitting at the kitchen room table with all these documents around and reading these reports. And my wife, Natalie, she walked in with uh, our newborn daughter on her arm. And I said, Natalie, the city, it's, it's drowning. We're going to have to leave. Samara is going to be one of the last generations to grow up here. She looked at me and said, hey, what are you going to do about it, John? <laughs> so I was like, so I kind of let that sink in for a little bit. And I said, there is no way that when 50 years from now, my children ask me, Dad, what were you doing when the city was drowning and the forests were burning? There was no way I was going to say that I was standing by. There was no way that I was going to have to say, oh, I don't know, I was making money. No, I refuse. So I said, I'm going to do something about it. So what does that even mean when you're trying to save a city from drowning, right? Well, I'll tell you one thing. If we don't save our forests, if we don't stop our forests from burning, nothing else matters. We have to save the forests. So that took me then on this journey of trying to figure out how do I make standing trees worth more alive than dead? Because that's the key. We need to generate these economic returns for trees as they stand. So that took me on this journey First, starting out writing policy papers and giving lectures at universities and all of that stuff. And at the end of that, I actually became the lead negotiator at the UN for climate change. I was given the privilege to represent my country on this incredibly important topic at the UN. So I did that for a few years. Then I got recruited by Conservation International to lead the Suriname program, which was an amazing 10 years. I was able to spar and learn from some of the brightest minds in conservation and science. I was able to travel the country, work with indigenous communities, and learn so much about what makes forests special. And after about 10 years, I said, okay, time to close that chapter. I wanna get back into doing something that really gets me going, and that's creating jobs, creating regenerative jobs, creating new forms of economic development in line with nature. And that's how me and my team, we came up with this idea. What if we can get cosmetics companies to use their enormous supply chain power for good? What if we can get them to buy directly from these communities and thereby leaving value in the forest so that people can make a living from that? And that's what we started, started doing. I'm gonna tell you, this can be done. And the reason I know it can be done is because when I was at CI, I actually had the privilege of working with a community that makes this, Brazil nut oil, in the forest. And attached to this little bottle is this entire concept of conservation and entrepreneurship. We were able to work with this community that is currently protecting 235,000 hectares, has created over 100 jobs just with one single community-owned venture. So we said, how are we gonna scale this? Let's take this 100x, right? This works. So let's offer technology, access to capital, and access to markets in one single system. And by doing so, we are able to then generate over 100 of these new ventures. And this is something that I started about, let's say 16 months ago, and it's been, a, it's been quite a journey. Uh, it's been about 16 months pounding the pavement, doing a lot of these um, interviews and talks. But over the last couple of months, we've started to make real progress. We've raised over $200,000. We found the software partner we need for the full traceability system. And we've even been able to start getting the first sales in just this past month. So we are starting to get traction. We are on our way. And in order to really get us across the line, I'm going to need much more help. So if any of you wanna get involved, any of you wanna sit down and talk with us to think about how do we get cosmetics companies to start using their purchasing power for good? How do we get them to interact directly and buy directly from these communities so that they can do their part in stewardship and keep forest standing? I hope to talk to some of you later today and I'd like to thank you for listening. Welcome to the stage, co-founder and principal of Implicate and Summit Impact Climate Fellow, Genevieve Ennis.
Good morning. I have this memory of the moment that I realized that not clearing my inbox had an impact on the climate. It was 2016, and I was working on a project that was exploring the creation of a network of data centers in the Arctic that was seeking to improve connectivity in the North. At the time, it was pretty common for folks in Nunavut to mail USB sticks to their families in the South in order to be able to access digital content because the best internet package at the time was capped at 15 gigs for $225 a month. Each additional gig was another $15, and at that rate, it meant that watching the first season of Stranger Things cost over $400, which it debuted that July. This lack of infrastructure, of digital infrastructure, had significant constraints for the healthcare, legal, and education systems that were often limited to a bandwidth of about six uh, megabytes per second, which is likely less than a 40th of your speed at home right now. When speaking with elders from the Gwinchin Nation, they described colonization as a process of division and isolation and felt that having access to information and connectivity was critical to the healing of circumpolar indigenous communities. We also came to realize at the time that the Arctic was in another unique position. Because it almost never got hot, data centers could run at a cooling capacity of 70% less than their counterparts to the south. This was so important because at the time, over half of the world's data centers were powered by coal. And so it was at this point that I started to consider the broader relationship between climate and data infrastructure. I'm inspired by the Kanyan Keaka scholar, Stephen Loft, who parallels technology to a shapeshifter, that it's neither inherently benign nor malevolent, but is always transforming the world. I believe deeply in the power of science and technology to act as drivers of progress, but I also believe that we have a responsibility to anticipate and respond to unintended consequences. The power of digital infrastructure lies in its potential to improve human rights, social inclusion, and poverty eradication. It supports democracy and knowledge aggregation, and it has the potential to mitigate climate change. But less than a decade ago, data centers globally used about 30 gigawatts of electricity annually. This is approximately the equivalent output of 30 nuclear power plants. By 2022, this had exploded to 240 terawatts, or the equivalent of 240,000 nuclear power plants. This is the ecological paradox of technology. It provides us with potential solutions to the climate crisis, but it also carries significant environmental impacts that disproportionately burden racialized and post-colonial communities and countries in the global south. Part of this can be traced to the explosion of AI. The computer power necessary for training AI models has doubled every 3.4 months since 2012. And as the size of our data sets grow, so does our requirements for energy. Life cycle assessments have shown that when we train common large models of AI, the training process can output Sick, over 626,000 pounds of carbon dioxide. This is nearly five times the emissions life cycle of an average American car. As we deploy AI in real world settings, it requires even more energy than it did for the training process. And this means that information and communication technology is currently on track to account for 14% of global emissions by 2040. For reference, the aviation industry today accounts for about 3%. The philosopher Bruno Latour calls on us to love our monsters. He reminds us that it wasn't until Frankenstein neglected his monster that it became such. And so to this end, there's a global digital rights movement that recognizes that what we build is not neutral and must be attended to with care. 
The Climate Tech Lab brings together scientists, engineers, legal experts, artists, and activists to apply, uh, to apply climate technology to alternative futures and to cultivate rigorous, creative, and practical policy to address some of these environmental impacts of data infrastructure. I'm so looking forward to having the opportunity to discuss with some of you how we can continue to best engage the emerging tech sector around how we address these challenges. Thank you. Welcome to the stage, Director of the Bridgetown Initiative for the Office of the Prime Minister of Barbados, Pepukai Bardawil. <laughs> My goodness, I didn't expect that. Good morning. I am Pat Bardewil, and I am the director of the Bridgetown Initiative, a bold global agenda aimed at transforming the international climate and development finance architecture. Why does this matter? Globally, we need at least $5.4 trillion a year to address inequalities related to the Sustainable Development Goals, which will provide basic um, uh, living conditions to people around the world who do not have sufficient food, water, health care, and education services, amongst other things. But we also need, in parallel, to address the climate crisis. $5.4 trillion is a lot of money, and right now it's not clear where those resources are going to come from. In this capacity, I have the singular honor of working for the absolutely amazing Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Amor Motley. Barbados championed the Bridgetown Initiative, so it was named after the capital city. And this was coined in 2022, when it became very clear that we needed to do something different in order to hustle and change the way resources are allocated. So the Bridgetown Initiative has a number of tenets that relate to providing additional liquidity, addressing the critical challenges of debt that countries around the world from Sri Lanka to Zambia have struggled with for the past many years, to addressing how we crowd in private financing into climate change mitigation and adaptation. But those $5.4 trillion that we need, while they're a global figure, really relate to resources that country platforms or country action plans need to crowd in. And so we have developed over the past several months a plan for prosperity and resilience. And notice that it does not say only climate resilience for Barbados. We believe that this plan can set the stage for countries around the world to develop their own approaches to resilience and sustainability. Well, what does this mean ultimately? It means that we want to see an increase in the sustainable economic growth rates of countries. And so that little dotted line shows that versus a business as usual case, we have increased growth over time. But it also means that our ability to both withstand shocks, which means the extent to which our economy declines if there is a climate crisis, as well as the speed at which we recover, which is point C, will shift as well. So we're trying to create a system which is able to literally weather the storm. How do we do this? Well, we do this by not just looking at reinforcing roads and bridges and making sure that people's roofs don't fly off when there's a Category 5 hurricane. We do this by building the foundation of social infrastructure. We make sure that health and education is strong. We make sure that there are opportunities for the bright young people that many of our countries, particularly in the Caribbean, have. These are resources that we're losing to the global north. We have tremendously educated young people who get their degrees and then do not have anywhere to go in a small island context. So they come to the US, they go to Canada, they go to Europe, and we have an effective brain drain. At the same time, particularly for small island states, we don't have very many resources because our territories are so small. But we do have large ocean states. So Barbados's investment plan is predicated on 12 areas, and there's one in particular that I would like to focus on. The total investment opportunity for Barbados is $14.5 billion over the next 10 years. That's an opportunity and not just a cost. And we believe that about half of the investment can lend itself to private sector participation. And one area in particular relates to the blue economy. Barbados is seeking to become the world's first blue Silicon Valley. 
we want to transform the country from a small island developing state to a large ocean state that crowds in the best and the brightest technologies, research, investment, and basically innovation that leverage all the tremendous skills that we have on the island and create something that can be replicated across the many island states globally. This is gonna cost in excess of at least $1 billion. And I invite you to come and discuss how we can transform the country together in a curated round table that we'll be having in Barbados in July. Thank you. Welcome to the stage, Chief Reef Officer of Coral Vita, and Summit Impact Climate Fellow, Sam Teicher. Good morning. My name is Sam Teicher. I am the co-founder and chief reef officer of Coral Vita, a company that grows corals to restore dying reefs, and I have a job that should not exist. So many of you can picture coral reefs. Maybe you've gotten to visit them while we cruise through the Bahamas. If you get the chance at Bimini, I highly recommend jumping in the water, getting to experience this incredible underwater world that we have uh, globally that not only is magical, but also is critically important. There's up to a billion people, quarter of marine life that depends on this single ecosystem with over $2.7 trillion generated annually by powering tourism economies, protecting coastlines from storms. But all of this wonder and value is threatened because reefs are dying. We've lost half the world's coral reefs since the 1970s, and we're currently on track to lose over 90% by 2050. So in a single human lifespan, we can see one of the mo world's most incredible and most important ecosystems disappear in front of our eyes. Now, the best thing to do for reefs is to stop killing them. We're lucky everyone in this room is working on the solutions that they're working on. Uh, but just as we can plant trees for reforestation, we can also plant corals for reef restoration. It's a field that's existed for several decades. There's amazing communities, NGOs, researchers that have shown how we can bring reefs back to life. But long story short, unfortunately, the existing model, these underwater gardens that are largely grant and donation funded, low tech, can only grow limited species of corals. They don't scale to meet this challenge. That's why we started Coral Vita, which is a mission-driven for-profit using commercial land-based coral farms to scale restoration. We are using breakthrough novel scientific methods to grow corals in months and years instead of decades and centuries, strengthen the resilience to threats like warming oceans, and deploying this model so we can scale restoration globally and keep reefs alive for future generations. We're also doing this as a business. So instead of a grant here, a donation there, looking back on those values that reefs provide, we have vertically integrated farms like the one very close, but not on the island we're going to in Freeport, Grand Bahama, where we sell restoration as a service to hotels, developers, insurers, governments, use our farms as revenue generating tourism attractions, we have adopt a coral campaigns, partnered with brands, well then also developing licensing technologies to other restoration practitioners, also that we can fund the ecosystem scale impact we need to keep reefs alive for the future. And while doing this, we have a community-based approach to our model wherever we go from the Bahamas to Saudi Arabia to Dubai, where we have operations, ensuring that we're hiring locally as much as possible, using our farms as education centers, partnering with NGOs locally based so that we can empower the communities that rely on these reefs the most. And it's not just something that's theoretical. Having lived in Grand Bahama for years, I was there for Hurricane Dorian, which was the strongest storm in recorded history to hit the country. I don't recommend staying for Cat Fives. And on top of the devastation it did across Abaco and Grand Bahama, billions of dollars lost, countless lives lost, we also saw how ecosystems like mangrove forests and coral reefs actually save people's lives. They gave people enough time to get to higher ground, to get to their neighbor's houses. So these ecosystems, nature really allows us to survive and thrive. We rely on nature a lot more than nature relies upon us. So having gone from that experience, we actually have taken massive steps forward. We're signing restoration contracts around the world. Uh, we were hired by the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology to help power what will become the biggest coral farm in the world, uh, working with the Global Fund of Coral, coral Reefs. And we were also recognized as the inaugural winner of Prince William's Revive Our Ocean Earthshot Prize. And just for scale, again, um, this is a sort of snapshot as well as a, a real shot of um, what the coral farm in Saudi Arabia is going to look like. Our technology, which is using AI machine learning with camera systems, is already being embedded into the, the project. We've got 30 tanks in the Bahamas. They're eventually going to have 400 tanks. And it's a model that not only can restore reefs in the Red Sea, but hopefully is replicable all around the world. 
And again, this was an idea that my friend and I started with a thousand dollar grant while we were in grad school. Um, there was small bits of money here and there going to this space, but now there's billions of dollars being committed from governments, the private sector, conservation financiers. And with our model, we really have an amazing opportunity to help scale restoration, not only through our own work, but hopefully showcasing how for profit, for good for nature, can deploy capital to other practitioners all throughout the world. We're looking at opportunities from here in Miami and Fort Lauderdale to Barbados, Mexico, the Maldives. Our ultimate vision is that every nation on earth needs large scale land based commercial coral farms. And we've had a tremendous amount of wins. I won't go through all these, but just all to say that it's an opportunity to highlight not just why coral restoration is necessary, but through this means, which is fun, hopefully people will get the chance to get in the water and, and plant corals with us, also to then advocate with the peps of the world and others to actually protect these ecosystems that sustain us all. Uh, excited to share, we're actually gearing up now for a Series A in the next month or two. It'll be the first Series A to my knowledge for a coral restoration company in the world. <laughs> Appreciate it. Um, and we actually have an open note right now as we look to, to close that out and start scaling around the world, invest more in R&D. We're looking to partner with people to help tell the story, to fund restoration, to connect with governments also that again, we really have this opportunity to catalyze a restoration economy that can ensure that these ecosystems that are incredible and so important survive and thrive for generations to come. We got an amazing team, started off with me and my co-founder Gator. We've now got 30 staff worldwide and are continuing to grow. And this is really a collective effort. So very much invite everyone here um, to, to come help us take care of coral reefs, jump in the water. And again, Coral Vita, Sam, and I'm looking forward to hanging out with you guys over the next few days. Welcome to the stage, co-founder and CEO of Aya Research Institute and Summit Impact Climate Fellow, Alexa White. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexa White. I'm so happy to be here with you all today. I'm going to be talking to you about environmental justice and why you should really care. And so... I want to begin with your understanding of food. And so uh, I do a lot of my research as a biologist in Hawaii. Uh, Hawaii relies a lot on imports and exports. If they were ever to be hit by a natural disaster, they only have about three days worth of food um, to survive. And so uh, a lot of that uh, helped me to understand exactly uh, my own upbringing. And so I was raised by my grandparents. Um, they are native from Texas and North Carolina, and they uh, moved up into the Great Migration um, as sharecroppers from the American South. And so throughout my childhood, I had a really uh, strong connection to land as well as water, trying to understand exactly how food nourished us and what that really meant for our bodies as well as our communities. And so this image is to give you a depiction of exactly where they came from and how America's connection to land is really important to me as well as all of us. And so throughout my time um, doing my research, I really struggled to have a connection to the work. I was in labs, I was constantly doing um, a lot of uh, academic research, and I didn't understand if there was a personal connection that I could really have to that work. And so this is an image, um, a piece of art from uh, Rinaldo Morales, um, giving you a really good depiction of environmental justice. And so what does that really mean, environmental justice? Environmental justice means that uh, there are different kinds of climate impacts that impact the global majority. Um, people of color, uh, people that uh, don't really have control over the sort of toxics and issues with the environment that um, infiltrate their communities and their homes. And so this image is meant to evoke emotion and help you to understand that um, there is something that needs to be hap there's something that needs to happen in terms of uh, how we address our food, our water, and our resources. And so um, through my research, uh, I had the pleasure of going to Hawaii and Jamaica. Um, I am an agroecologist, so I'm really interested in how we're going to feed ourselves in the next 50 years. Um, and here I am talking to a farmer in Waimea, Hawaii, on the big island. Um, and I was having a conversation with him um, about policy, about all the things that I'd learned throughout my biology education. And I realized that there was a, a large disconnect between what he understood as his farming and what I understood as a scientist. And so uh, through that uh, came this theory 
uh, that I produce called the Researcher Practitioner Divide, which basically just highlights how a lot of the things that we uh, as consumers and kind of just uh, existing on this planet do, uh, the, the people who do the research behind it don't really know that. They don't really go into the field and understand exactly why uh, these things are happening. And so uh, that problem led me to co-found the IR Research Institute. And so the IA Research Institute was co-founded by a friend of mine, um, Adrian Peterkin and I. Uh, we have the mission to increase the amount of environmental justice scientists and engineers of color that are doing climate justice technology research. And so we have a laboratory in Detroit as well as at MIT. Uh, and so uh, through that, uh, we really have the goal to uh, address three main problems. And so the first is that scientists and engineers really are not trained in community engagement. They don't really have uh, the uh, ability through educational programs here in the United States to uh, understand what it means to build a relationship and to have a really uh, intimate connection with people who they are going to be impacting. Two. Uh, they aren't usually paid as well when they're doing this kind of passion work. So the typical salary of uh, a scientist or engineer uh, within academia, uh, usually they'd like to go off into some private industry work instead of doing the work that's really needed and that we that we would really want to see. And then three, um, the people who are affected in these communities are not really reflected in the communities of scientists and engineers. And so. Um, Obviously, if you'd like to solve a problem, you should probably ask the people who are being uh, uh, problematized. So uh, these three things are really the core to why AYA uh, exists and what we're doing today. And so today, uh, our laboratories are really centered around environmental justice screening tools. And so we uh, are focused on mapping different areas of the world that pay attention to where natural disasters were happen will happen, flooding, hurricanes, earthquakes, we are producing predictive technologies in order to uh, help these communities uh, to either better uh, transition away from those areas or to mitigate those climate problems. And so, um, I would really like to just ask you to imagine a world where all of these things are right. Imagine a world where the people who are experiencing these problems are getting to solve the problems, and imagine a world where there's a diversity of thought, religion, ideas, and science and engineering is uh, something that is commonplace in your home and uh, within your current dialogue. So I invite you to talk to me after this. My name is Alexa White again. Um, I'm a biologist, and uh, I hope to see you soon. Thank you. All right, let's give one big more round of applause to all the Summit Fellows. Yeah. <laughs> and now you all get a little bit of a taste of our work at Summit Impact. This is just the most amazing, joyful, incredible thing that we get to do is work with people like this regularly and be part of their solutions and part of their fascinating approaches to all of these different aspects of climate solutions. And now it's your turn. So we're about to split up into breakout groups when I say go. There'll be one group for every fellow. You'll see them spread out around the room. The way you'll know where to find them is you'll see a facilitator, someone from our Summit Impact team, holding a sign like this. And you will find the sign with the fellow whose breakout you want to go to. There's also going to be a prompt for that breakout. Actually, could we signal that slide? Might be a slide with the prompts somewhere, maybe. <laughs> And basically, soon on the screen, we'll find that slide, and you'll see which prompt, kind of which um, idea you want to focus on. But you already saw the fellows speak, so you know generally what they're, what they're working on. The other thing I just want to mention is that we actually have a sixth climate fellow. Lacey, can you raise your hand and say hello? <laughs> um, Lacey is the CEO and founder of Olicon Minerals, which diverts harmful drainage water from ocean life and also provides sustainably sourced minerals for various industries. So she'll also be hosting a circle to talk about her work. If you're interested in that field, that approach, and getting to know her, because she's amazing, um, you can also join her circle. Okay, so let's see if maybe... 
Misty, do we have a solution for the, the breakout slide? Getting that up on the screen? You will have it in a moment. Um, our facilitators, you have your signs ready. There they go. Okay, so in a moment, the breakout prompt will go on, but right now you can go ahead, start looking for the fellow whose group you want to join, and we'll come back together, everyone, to close out the session in about 25 minutes. All right, let's go. All right, welcome back, everyone. We're going to... Bring your attention back here for a minute so we can sadly pause the conversations, close them out just for right now. Yes, yes. Now is the time. Come back. Fellows, if you could come towards the stage. I'm looking at... Yeah, we're going to do it. We're going to do it. It's not easy. Perfect. Thank you, friends. Bring your attention back. We'll just do a quick close out here. Yes, Jen, come come on up. Yep, all fellows up here. All right, everybody. Okay. Attention, attention. Thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to pass the mic to each fellow to just share one sentence, one wrap-up on, on something that came out of their circle, something they're thinking about, kind of a final note for us today. And then I'll give you a few important closing notes, and then that'll be that. Right. Oh. Yep. <laughs> right. Listen, we had an amazing session. Um, a subset of our group is going to come to Barbados sometime between July and September to tie... <laughs> Woo! to talk tangibly about how we create the Silicon Valley. Thank you so much. Alexa here, thank you all for coming. Um, a part of our session was really talking about how language shapes reality. And in order for us to all come together to have some sort of impact, we all have to be on the same page and open up those kind of bridges for communication. So thank you. Beautiful. Um, you know, every connection matters. You, you could support coral restoration through jewelry, through music, through investment, through community building and just having that opportunity to all collaborate together uh, is super exciting. And hopefully also we'll be doing that in Barbados Barbie. soon. <laughs> yeah. All right. Pep, what do I need to do to come to Barbados? Just come. All right. Come I'm in. Crop over. Yeah. Okay. okay. Sorry, guys. That's a, that's a Caribbean thing going on there. Uh-huh. So anyway, just from my side, you know, there's not one specific thing. Just Again, full gratitude, and also the people who joined me at the table. We got very, really specific and concrete, and we might even have a lead for like somebody to help buy oils from us from the communities. And this is just like the first hour of the first day, right? Yeah. That's summit, man. So I just love the energy. I love all the possibilities that are just flooding towards towards this, and and the wonderful warm connections. So thank you, everybody. Thanks, John. Um, I had such appreciation for folks' enthusiasm and interest and curiosity. I think one of the main things that I'm taking away from this is just the importance around how far we have to go in terms of closing a gap around awareness. And so thank you so much for everyone's interest and support. And then lastly, can we just give a hand for the pre presenters today? I think they did an amazing job, very inspiring. Um, yeah, and the Summit Impact thing for putting this together. Um, I just want to say, I was in Pep's group. I think the one thing I'm taking away is it takes a village, and there's so much um, to value in this room, and we all can help. We have something to contribute. So just hearing from the startups, understanding what resources they've identified, the people who are running venture incubators, um, the people who've lived in Silicon Valley, how do we duplicate that in a place like Barbados? Um, it's just an inspiring conversation, and I'm really looking forward to the next few days. So thank you. Yeah. You can hold on to that one, actually. I've got this. Um, all right. Thank you, everyone, for the kind attention. As Lacey just said, it takes a village. Um, as I was talking about at the very beginning of the session, this is work we're meant to do together, right? This is what it means to be part of a community, is that we get to bring amazing things to life together thanks to these incredible leaders on our stage. So before we let you go and close out, um, there's one thing I must ask of all of you. Raise your hand if you have been to your assembly station to check in for your safety drill. 
Yes, you are the winners. I am not one of those yet, but I'm about to be, and so are the rest of us. Um, right after this session, please go check in with your assembly station. You should have watched the video in your room. If you don't check in, the ship actually won't depart until a certain amount of people have checked in. We have had problems with this at some in the years past, so please don't be one of those people who's a straggler. Find your safety station, assembly station, check in. That's the logistics note. Um, other than that, I just want to say thank you all for coming. It's amazing what's possible when we do this together. Let's do... Oh, let's do a... I was getting a signal from my team. Um, let's just give one more really big round of applause for all of you, for your attention, and for our Summit Fellows. And we'll see you at the Climate Catalyst Meetup tomorrow at 4 p.m. and throughout the rest of this amazing experience that is just beginning. So thank you, everyone. Okay.